最近喺我繼續對於金融呢一個研究過程裏面咧，我就睇咗一套電視劇，叫做《北平無戰事》。我好想喺呢度同大家分享一下。喺我分享之前咧，我希望各位都好似我一樣，站喺金融嗰個角度，作為一個香港人。以香港作为一个国际金融中心呢一个角色去睇呢一条片，因为其实而家已经去到东起就西落嘅一个百年一遇嘅大转变噶。我由一九年开始咧，就觉得我一定要花好多时间去研究，究竟我哋个国家，我哋呢个新中国喺过去。系点样打仗嘅？由二零一九年到而家，我可以讲自己终于完成咗一个 paradigm shift 啦，呢个范式转移，我终于拥有另外一种角度去睇西方嘅金融同埋我哋中国嗰个分别，同埋点解中国玩得越嚟越好。但系西方玩得越嚟越，基本上焦头烂额，一定要不断咁样去制造战争、制造混乱，先至可以令到佢嗰种金融嘅游戏继续可以续落去、续命续落去。但系其实而家睇怕都冇可能噶啦，就算佢开埋中国呢一个战线，都冇乜可能噶。香港作为一个国际金融中心，我哋如果唔能够有一个范式转移，继续用老一套、西方嗰一套继续玩落去嘅话呢我哋嘅财富基本上系跟住美国一齐咁样烟消云散嘅啫。所以，不论嗰条片里面系站喺国民党嗰个角度，或者系共产党嗰个角度，我哋。嘗試一下抌咗呢兩個概念，純粹站喺經濟嘅角度睇呢一條片。一九三五年十一月三日，國民政府頒布財政改革必至令，開始在全國範圍內實行法幣改革。到一九四五年，法幣的發行量已經高達五千五百六十九億元，比一九三七年的時候增加了三百六十倍，而物價則上漲了八萬七千倍。到一九四八年八月，金元券取代法币时，法币的发行量已经达到了六百六十三万亿，相当于一九三七年时的四十七万倍，物价更是上涨了三千四百九十二万倍，钞票的面值也从五十、一千、两千迅速的增加，印刷法币的纸张也越来越大。曾有人感叹，手握万元大钞就如同废纸一张，但要不了多久，手里拿着一元钞票也同样不值钱。经济形势恶化，直接导致了上海的黄金风潮，也导致了整个中国社会动荡，物价飞涨，工业生产日益萧条，法币作为一种货币的职能基本丧失。人们就算拿到法币，也想方设法的尽快将它拿出去换成实物。但后来商家发现，收了法币之后，尽快第一时间进货，也买不回原来数量的货物了。于是，一时间，各行各业店铺关门停业。法币作为货币信用已经丧失，整个货币处在了崩溃边缘。1948年8月19日，当时一斤猪肉的价格为140万元，比起1936年的时候涨了500万倍。因此，当时每当发工资的时候，人们手里拿着成捆的法币，甚至用麻袋来装，但并没有多少人面露喜色，因为这些钱到手上，如果不能以最快的速度用出去，过不上几天，也许就又如同废纸一张了。所以在当时交易中，人们因为法币贬值太快，已经很难使用了。随后进行的金元券改革，强制将平民百姓的金银外币收缴。尽管在发行之初看起来物价确实下降，但国民政府不过是借此手段，并没有增加金银外币收入。很快便出现了抢购风潮，随后蔓延全国，金元券也迎来了大崩溃。原本限定的二十亿金元券限额很快突破。1948年年底增加到了83亿。
。到1949年上海解放时，金圆券的总发行额达到了68万亿，一年的时间增加了 3.4 万倍，比法币的贬值速度更快。到最后，金圆券在很多地区已不再流通，成为了一张废纸。由于版权的关系，我截录咗另外一条片落嚟。到底香港有金融背景嘅，或者系读紧关于金融经济嘅学生，有几多人了解过金元券嗰段历史呢？我喺一九年开始就不断咁样专注去研究中国过去由满清破咗产之后，去到而家嗰段历史，尤其是系金融嗰方面嘅历史。要抌咗嗰个意识形态，共产党或者系国民党或者系民主啊呢啲咁嘅意识形态，你站喺金融嘅角度去了解嘅话，其实系真系好辛苦嘅、呃。我咧就一直都系、呃、去内地嗰度去揾资料啦。咁所以你好自然咧，你会系企喺。當時毛澤東佢打江山嗰個角度去誒觀察中國新中國誒，佢由搞革命去到而家自己誒擁有嘅嗰一套經世濟民嘅金融手段，而呢一套電視劇《北平無戰事》咧，正正就補上咗。喺當時中國城市裏面，以投機、以西方美元嗰套嘅玩法，呢套電視劇咧，俾我知道原來我哋而家所了解到嘅委內瑞拉化嘅一個通貨膨脹，原來喺當時發金元券嘅中國咧，已經出現噶啦。原来由一九三五年开始，中国就已经出现咗委内瑞拉化噶啦。呢、这个对于我嚟讲真系好震惊啊！因为喺呢个世界有好多地方咧都破咗产噶，佢哋个破产咧就系俾人哋用金融嘅手段咧搞到民不聊生。原来喺法币金元券嗰个年代，中国。亦都同樣俾人哋咁樣搞到民不聊生，但係與此同時咧，中國已經出現咗另外一種金融手段，係以實物作為背書嘅新中國發行嘅，亦即係人民幣前身嘅貨幣，而且喺共產黨控制嗰個區域嗰度咧流通緊噶，我哋。一直都系读西方嘅书，接受西方俾我哋嘅教育，所以我哋根本完全唔知道呢个世界上咧有另外一种玩法嘅。喺新中国，佢哋玩嘅嗰套嗰套金融体系系赢咗嘅喎。点解我咁样讲呢？当共产党解放咗全中国之后咧，上海咧嗰、那个。生活方式咧系冇变过噶。然后在上海囤积，再以黑市美钞价抛售，转移获利数十倍、上百倍，公然抢购本该属于政府收购的粮食，大量囤积，如入无人之境。就算系解放咗之后嘅上海咧，基本上都系差唔多一样嘅。但系新中国咧，用佢哋嘅方法喺上海打金融战。打到最收尾呢，上海嗰班炒家呢，系真系对共产党系佩服到五体投地，就好似我而家喺香港一样。我已经观察咗自己国家喺香港打嘅每一次嘅金融战，我觉得非常之精彩。新中国成立咗之后，改革开放之前嘅人民币呢。我哋嗰张人民币啊，其实唔系我哋能够而家理解嘅嗰个人民币嚟噶。当时嘅人民币咧，佢唔系一个方便我哋做交易嘅一个货币，一张纸嚟噶。佢系一个实物嘅代表嚟噶
以小米，我哋食嗰啲小米啊，作为背书去印出嚟嘅一张人民币，而我哋不断咁样去耻笑、去睇小嘅粮票啊，系一种非常之好嘅金融手段嚟噶。你自己再仔细啲去了解一下自己嘅国家，佢点样可以喺头三十年里面呢，完成咗？第一桶金，然之後咧，將自己嘅軍工同埋重工業咧，係建立起嚟。最基本嘅、最初步嘅工業化咧，係建立起嚟，改革開放。各位，你哋認為係乜嘢呢？喺尼克遜去建毛澤東嘅時候，當時嘅美國，佢個經濟係點㗎？各位有冇留意過啊？當時美國嘅經濟係唔好噶，如果佢唔去揾中國嘅話咧，佢面對嘅經濟危機係隨時好似二零零八年咁樣噶。因為美國嗰套金融玩法咧，係一定要割一個好大體量嘅韭菜先至可以續命噶。佢條命呢一、这個以美元計價嘅成個體系啊！佢個生命嘅延續係因為我哋中國嘅改革開放，中國用咗頭三十年咧，辛辛苦苦建立出嚟嘅以實物為主嘅一個好龐大嘅體量，同美國一個虛度爆嘅呢一個金融為主嘅體系咧結合，先至有如此一個和平。嘅階段，令到每一個中國人，包括喺香港、台灣、海外嘅中國人都咁富裕嘅咋。講到呢度，我或者做一個總結啦，就係、是、喺四九年之前嘅中國，其實已經出現過而家我哋見到嘅嗰種委內瑞拉化，亦即係話你要買一罐汽水呢，你要攞一車嘅紙幣。先至買得起，但係原來喺嗰個時間咧，站喺金融嘅角度，站喺經濟嘅角度咧，我哋嘅國家已經有另外一個解決方案噶啦。嗰、那個解決方案咧係有實物作為背書推行發行出嚟嘅人民幣啊。當時嘅人民幣背後係以食用嘅小米作為背書。而出嚟噶，所以嗰个货币咧，同西方嗰个玩虚嘅货币咧，系完全两个唔同嘅概念嚟噶。我要去了解呢一个概念咧，我都做咗一段好长嘅时间嘅一个范式转移 （paradigm shift）， 先至能够将自己调整过来，然之后跟住。去分得清楚究竟两者之间嘅玩法嗰个区别喺边度，而且当新中国成立咗之后，整个中国玩嘅一个经济同埋外国玩嘅一套经济体系咧，已经系分道扬镳咗噶啦。西方嘅嗰一套经济体系咧，发展到而家都系冇变化过。令到我哋一直都深信资本主义系好厉害嘅呢一个讲法，原来只不过系殖民主义一直延伸落嚟嘅一套以资本为本嘅一个玩法而已。去到现在，成个美元体系已经去到。資本主義嘅最後一個階段，亦即係話西方嗰一套殖民化行到而家，基本上都已經係一條活路，已經行唔到落去。但係相反，中國由四九年開始就已經玩一套全新嘅以實物作為背書嘅一種經濟體系。喺呢個經濟體系裏面，有資本主義，亦都有我哋傳統嘅實物財富呢一個概念。我哋為咗
要行工業化，其實我哋係採用咗資本主義嘅嗰一套嘅。喺行資本主義嗰一套嘅過程裏面，咧，係必定有經濟危機嘅。喺國外，中國以外嘅地方，每一次嘅經濟危機咧，西方人咧就會利用。嗰、那個經濟危機咧，去割人哋韭菜，咁將自己嘅問題咧，通過美元咧，就輸送咗出去國外、美國以外嘅地方。每一次都係咁樣，但係中國咧就唔係咁樣做法嘅。我哋國家化解自己，因為要搞工業革命，一定要利用資本主義呢一套去搞工業革命。而出嚟嘅經濟危機呢，我哋係通過自己嘅農村去化解嘅。所以咁多年落嚟，七十幾年喎，咁多年落嚟，我哋行到而家，我哋嘅農村已經變得支離破碎。我哋擁有咗一定程度嘅工業化之後，科學化之後，科技化之後，我哋中國要。要翻翻去建設我哋嘅農村噶啦，所以喺呢段時間，我哋國家嘅任務係非常之重大嘅。喺結束之前，我想同各位講嘅就係、是，其實我哋由四九年去到而家，站喺實物財富呢一個立場或者呢一個角度去睇自己國家嘅時候，相比喺中國以外嘅其他所有地方。你知唔知道我哋國家成功地建立咗幾多實實在在嘅財富啊？你淨係睇下我哋中國幾乎所有人都脱貧，就非常清楚明白。好可惜嘅就係我哋呢個香港要跟鬼佬嗰一套，全中國只有香港嗰個貧富懸殊嘅嗰個貧都仲未脱離得到。呢、这個將會係中國嘅下一個重點要處理嘅一個問題。中國利用咗呢七十幾年，包括埋我哋一直都以為中國好落後嘅改革開放嘅嗰一段時間，一步一步咁樣將所有實實在在嘅財富、製造業、我哋嘅航天科技。军工、新能源车等等等等，全部都系实实在在嘅财富嚟噶。再加上而家西方玩嘅一套无虚嘅金融，我哋都有。喺呢一个无虚嘅金融嘅游戏里面，我哋定咗好多新嘅規則。我哋亦都会慢慢将呢个无虚嘅金融游戏赋予实物。去玩，站喺全世界，你作为一个国际投资者，你会去边个国家去投资呢？嗱，时间咧就差唔多啦，记得分享、订阅同埋点赞啊！下次见，拜拜。America, here is a record of it to judge for yourself. City streets pounded by ever increasing traffic are modernized, resurfaced. Thousands of blocks which mean huge savings. In local tax money, vital to the communities which they serve are the thousands of miles of highways constructed and improved by the Works Program. The need for first-class highways grows constantly as the automobile and the motor truck become increasingly important in both city and rural commerce. In many regions, great loss has befallen farmers and other rural residents during periods of bad weather, which made secondary roads impassable. The need for adequate farm-to-market roads, which would make the transportation of farm produce independent of weather conditions, has been recognized in all parts of the country. But not until the beginning of the works program was it possible to initiate a general plan for the development of farm-to-market roads. This plan brings immediate improvement in local business and property values wherever a secondary road is completed. At last, the farmer finds it possible to reach his market over well-constructed, weatherproof roads. In all these construction projects, local labor is employed, and wherever possible, the raw materials are obtained from quarries in the immediate vicinity. How big is the WPA road program? 
In its first 18 months of operation, the mileage end-to-end would have stretched five times around the earth. In many parts of the country are regions which depend largely upon the tourist's trade as a local industry. Areas of great scenic beauty have been made available to thousands of visitors through the development of systems of roads in national and state parks and at other centers of attraction for tourists. Many of these vacation spots were completely inaccessible before the assistance of the works program made road construction possible. The welfare of the community served by a new construction project is always the first consideration, and plans are laid not only for the present, but for the more demanding future. In the field of public health, many important and permanent improvements have been undertaken. The water resources of thousands of cities and towns have been expanded by the construction of reservoirs and water supply systems, ensuring an adequate supply of water for the community's needs for many years to come. A particularly interesting example of a long-felt need met by the works program is this reservoir at Atlantic City. Although this resort entertains millions of visitors every year, it never has had an adequate water supply until this reservoir was built. Another type of permanent construction is this community stadium, representative of a large group of projects that provide facilities for public gatherings all over America. In cooperation with other federal agencies, many important improvements have been made under the works program at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and other centers of government activity. As an aid to traffic, hundreds of new bridges have been completed, designed to withstand high waters and the pounding of heavy loads. Thousands of other bridges have been repaired and made safe. Many cities have been freed from the peril of disease by the provision of modern, scientific, correct sewage systems, which often replace antiquated systems entirely inadequate for the needs of the community. Developments such as these are always undertaken with the cooperation of the public health agencies serving each locality, and the projects are carried out under the supervision of competent sanitary engineers. Rapid growth of air traffic outdistanced airport for hundreds of cities is the opportunity offered by the WPA to build or improve modern airports. One of the busiest of all airports is at Newark. This field is the eastern terminus of all of the great transcontinental airlines, and hundreds of transport ships land and take off from its runways every day. At Newark, as at a great many other cities, the works program has provided jobs for thousands of workers in the improvement of existing facilities and in new construction. At Cleveland, Great Industrial Center, emergency work built an immense landing mat, the largest single piece of paving in the world. At Detroit, both construction and improvements were completed. Second largest of American cities and first in transportation is Chicago, where an extensive program of airport improvements have given the city adequate air terminal facilities. Philadelphia is third among our cities in population, yet this Pennsylvania metropolis has never had its own airport. Passengers bound for Philadelphia by air have been forced to land in another city, in fact, in another state. Not until the Great Works program became a reality was it possible to begin the construction of this air terminal on the site of the faint island shipyards. The increase in air transportation has also made necessary the development of hundreds of emergency landing fields along the regular flying routes. Frequently, the need for these fields is greatest where the work of preparation is most difficult. But safety in passenger transport requires the clearing of fields at frequent intervals. In the larger cities where the concentration of population is greatest, slum clearance projects have been undertaken. In some areas, new modern housing developments will be erected, providing better living conditions for workers in the low-income groups. In other locations, the land cleared will be used for public parks and playgrounds. In all parts of the country, the letters WPA are a symbol of progress and improvement. On buildings under construction, they mean the replacement of inadequate public facilities by new, well-planned structures. On buildings under repair, they mean the preservation of existing structures for greater utility. Many thousands of such jobs as these dot the map of the United States, giving work and hope to people who can't find jobs, impetus to retail trade and heavy industry, 
and permanent improvements to a host of communities for the years to come. Not only was it necessary to find employment for workers accustomed to manual labor, but also there was need to employ others whose training and experience fitted them for professional and other skilled work. For these so-called white-collar workers, each community had to plan jobs which would utilize and preserve their skill and training. And above all, the work must be useful, a real contribution to the welfare of the community. In planning traffic control for congested cities, jobs have been found which require varying degrees of skill. In the study of traffic problems, the first step is to determine the number of vehicles passing a given point. Then experts are employed to lay out new routes and regulations which will ensure greater safety for both motorists and pedestrians. Manpower for hundreds of such surveys is provided by the WORKS program. Tests have been devised to determine the ability and fitness of drivers so that the element of human failure may be eliminated. In cooperation with the police departments of several cities, automobile inspection stations have been established in an effort to reduce the number of unsafe vehicles on the road. Under the supervision of expert mechanics, every safety device is carefully checked for perfect operation. The laws of many states and cities require a regular inspection of this nature, and the possession of an up-to-date inspection label is necessary before the car owner may use his automobile on the streets and highways. Another example of useful employment is found in the sewing rooms operated by the works program in practically every city in the country. Expert craftsmanship is encouraged in design groups associated with the sewing projects. Women who are the principal support of their families are paid for their work, and the millions of garments and miscellaneous articles they produce are distributed free to families on relief or to tax-supported institutions. For some of the women who work in these sewing rooms, the training and practical experience they receive will not only make them better housewives, but it may also open up avenues to a permanent source of income. Many other types of employment are provided for women. In a number of weaving projects, instruction is given in an interesting and useful craft. Part-time employment is provided in many kitchens where clean, wholesome school lunches are prepared for undernourished children of needy families. In libraries and schools, skilled workers are employed in repairing and rebinding millions of books. In many places where books were hard to find, over 2,000 traveling libraries now supply the demand for knowledge and entertainment and general health supervision. No other medical assistance of this nature is available. The nursing projects bring health and happiness where formerly death and misery were all too common. Their visits run into the millions. New interests have vanquished the darkness of despair in the lives of thousands of sightless men and women as a result of several projects in which books and maps have been translated into Braille, the written language of the blind. The proofreading of these works is done by sightless experts. In some cities, instruction is given in the reading of Braille maps. The tragedy of blindness has been the lot of thousands of our people in regions of coma, a dread eye disease is prevalent. Many of its victims are prevented by poverty, isolation, or infirmity from receiving medical attention. To these people come visiting nurses, examine suspected cases, and provision is to free clinics. With this assistance, medical science has found it possible to control a disease which is a menace to young and old alike, in many cases affecting every member of a large family. Needless to say, the staff necessary to maintain this important service is recruited from the trained workers of the regions concerned. And again, useful employment is combined with an enterprise of great and immediate value to the community. Everyone is familiar with the fine work being done by the famous Warm Springs Foundation in the cure of children crippled by infantile paralysis. To thousands who would otherwise be hopeless cripples for the rest of their lives has been given the chance to overcome their handicaps. Much of the success of the treatment given at Warm Springs and elsewhere 
depends upon the existence of therapeutic pools in which patients may gradually recover the use of their muscles through exercise made easier by the support of warm water. In many parts of the country, WPA labor has constructed pools such as these and trained WPA workers make up the staffs which assist in the medical treatment. This therapeutic pool is in the James Whitcomb Riley Memorial Hospital in Indiana, made doubly interesting by Riley's immortal poem about the little crippled boy with curvature of the spine. In hundreds of cities, the works program safeguards the health of many thousands of normal children of preschool age. In nursery schools, the children of needy and working mothers are provided with the best of care and medical supervision projects which are part of a broad educational program in which the WPA has helped millions of children and adults. Supervised play activities and preschool training under competent instructors removed from the relief roles are part of the schedule at each of these nursery schools. Meals are provided for the youngsters, and plenty of health-building milk and orange juice is consumed during the mid-morning and mid-afternoon lunches. The food is prepared under the supervision of dietitians, and at all times a careful check of the health and development of the children is maintained. In these nursery schools, acquire habits which will guard their health later in life. Here is a work which lays the foundation for a new generation of good citizens. Another part of the works program enters the field of adult education. And this subject embraces a number of widely varied projects. Some of the most interesting of the WPA projects in adult education are the classes in which hundreds of thousands of foreign-born people learn the language and customs of their adopted country. Vocational training projects are another branch of the adult education program. Many classes established in which instruction is given to men and women who will find very practical uses for their newly acquired knowledge in their daily lives. Every effort is made to adapt the instruction to the need and native ability of the student. Women are instructed in the arts and crafts for which they are best fitted, as exemplified in the millinery classes. In the same general category, we find classes for men in which the students are initiated into the art of tailoring. Through the training they receive here, they will be enabled to take up a profitable trade which will assure them of work and independence. A project which combines rehabilitation and education is found in the many household training classes operated by the WPA. Here, future housewives are instructed in homemaking, and inexperienced girls from relief families are given training which will make them self-supporting. As the girls master each branch of household art, their progress is indicated on a chart. Upon graduation, the girls are placed through an employment service conducted by the works program. To the young people of the nation, eager in their quest of knowledge, the works program, in cooperation with the National Youth Administration, offers part-time employment to enable them to continue their education. The type of employment offered is determined by the needs of the community in which the young people live. In fruit-growing districts, canning units have been set up in which girls can and preserve fruit for local householders. Part of the product is distributed to families on relief. An interesting project in New England is that in which boys, many of them from seafaring families, are engaged in the catching and breeding of fish and the restocking of fishing grounds. As they cast their nets into the sea, the action symbolizes their search for education, security, the simple riches of life. And toward this objective, the normal heritage of every young American, the works program offers them a helping hand. The sensitive fingers of artists are poorly suited to manual labor 
And in finding suitable work for musicians and other artists, the WPA has contributed greatly to the culture of America. A typical project is this Negro choir singing the spirituals that are the real folk music of America. Painters, too, contribute their bit to making the works program a real and permanent accomplishment. These reproductions of the American scene of today will make this one of the most fertile periods of our country's art. Some of this work is done on canvas, but much of it is created on the walls of our schools, libraries, and other public buildings in the form of mural paintings. Of particular interest is the great mural in the mess hall of the Military Academy at West Point, depicting great warriors of history. An art long dormant in the United States is the creation of stained glass windows. One project devoted to this art has made a window for the Military Academy at West Point, depicting scenes from the life of Washington. Commemorative tablets like this are among the contributions of sculptors to the works program, and they also create works of art for our parks and public buildings. Many American museums have long been in need of highly skilled experts to restore valuable historical material, such as this Persian ceiling, which is forming under the deft fingers of a WPA artist in the Philadelphia Museum. In many other museums, fossils and animal skeletons are being prepared and mounted for study. Inevitably comes disaster, as it has through all the ages of history. So today, flood, fire, and famine relentlessly persecute the human race. In this land of ours, so bountifully supplied by nature with fertile lands and rich forests, disaster has taken a terrible toll. Raging floods have swept the green valleys, imprisoning great cities in the grasp of icy waters, leaving destruction and the threat of disease in their wake. But in the moment of greatest need, the shock troops of disaster go into action with a courage and perseverance which armed our forefathers against despair. The shock troops of disaster, the great army of WPA workers diverted from their work of construction and improvement to meet a pressing emergency, have proven their merit through many tragic hours which have harried at far-flung areas of the nation. Working hand in hand with other agencies of relief, the men and women of the WPA take up the work of rescue, evacuation, and relief the first thought for the saving of imperiled lives and the protection of threatened areas from advancing waters, the orderly program goes swiftly forward. Food is distributed to flood victims from outdoor kitchens and carloads of warm clothes and bedding are rushed to shivering refugees from WPA sewing rooms in many states. In emergency hospitals, thousands of lives are saved by Red Cross and volunteer nurses and doctors assisted by trained WPA workers. For hundreds of miles along the flood area, the WPA supplies the shock troops that hold the river within man-made walls. Levee workers transport material by hand, by truck, by boat. Working day and night, they fill countless thousands of sandbags, raising the levees above the record crest. Often working under the skilled direction of Army engineers, relief workers fight the flood at every point.
people of the flood area will not soon forget the courage of these heroic workers, for Administrator Harry Hopkins heard their praise along the full route of his inspection trip as head of the President's Committee. As the waters subside after the work of rescue is completed comes a new battle against the threat of disease. The wreckage and debris left by the flood must be quickly removed. Proper conditions of sanitation must be re-established to prevent the epidemics which were once certain to take an additional toll of life. And so from the first moment of danger to the day when life again takes up its even flow, the works program offers aid to those who need it most. The roaring waters that bring disaster to fertile valleys have a terrible rival in the drought which has afflicted thousands of square miles of our western plains. Ruin and famine come in the wake of the hot, dry winds which tear the rich soil from the grass roots. Here again, the shock troops of disaster marshal their forces against devastation. Dust, once the valuable topsoil of the farm country, is now carried in whirling clouds, choking and blinding people and livestock rolling on higher, wider, and blacker until the land itself, upon which everything else depends, the land it took nature 100 years to the inch to build up, is blowing away. In this emergency, too, the shock troops of disaster marshal their forces against devastation. With the aid of WPA workers, food, housing, and medical care are provided for those who have been driven from their homesteads by the threat of famine. There is great immediate danger from inflammation of eyes, throats, and lungs tortured by dust. Expert clinical care for children and adults is provided to minimize the danger to life and health. to their vital work of providing the necessities of life for refugees, the WPA has found work for thousands of farmers who have been deprived of a livelihood by the drought. These men are working on projects important to the afflicted area, such as roads and fire lanes. To them, this work provides a means of carrying on in the face of the hardships inflicted by nature. Drought is a grave national problem, correcting it a mammoth undertaking. As a step in this direction, relief workers are engaged in the construction of many dams to conserve future rainfalls. Construction work on water conservation projects requires an immense number of skilled and unskilled workers providing immediate employment for hundreds of those who would otherwise be on relief. Those who suffered because of the drought are now employed on projects designed for their own future benefit. Thus, the works program answers the need of both the individual and the community. comes the added peril of fire, an ever-present danger to lives and property in forest-covered regions. Fire is a constant menace to one of the nation's greatest assets, the great timberlands which are so important to industry and to the very life of our soil. When the hot sun through long rainless weeks has baked leaves and wood to the dryness of tinder, it requires only the spark of a cigarette or a flash of lightning to bring about devastation and ruin. 
Manpower is needed to fight the planes to prevent the spread of fiery destruction. And again, the shock troops of disaster rally to the challenge, dropping their normal work of construction and improvement to respond to the emergency needs of the nation. Playgrounds and other recreation areas play an increasingly important part in the lives of our people. The construction, improvement, and maintenance of thousands of such centers under the works program provides millions of people with healthful, pleasant surroundings for relaxation and play. Regions of congested population, the WPA has cooperated with national and state park agencies in the improvement of recreational areas easily accessible to those who live in large cities. Countless thousands of men, women, and children each year make use of the new facilities for play and relaxation. In the cities themselves, playgrounds have been opened in every conceivable location. Employment has been provided for thousands of skilled and unskilled workers engaged in the preparation and equipment of parks and playgrounds where children who formerly were forced to play in the streets may find safe recreation. Many of these playgrounds are staffed by trained instructors drawn from the relief roads. Impressive heat of summer, swimming pools are a haven of refuge for young and old alike. Hundreds of such pools with well-equipped bathhouses have been constructed by WPA labor. The trained supervisors and instructors provided for these recreation centers have been removed from relief roads. A new idea in bringing happiness to underprivileged children is the toy lending library established as an experiment in an eastern city. A large supply of toys is kept on hand, and the youngsters are allowed to borrow one at a time. Hundreds of young children find their dreams brought to life in this novel enterprise. The conservation of human resources is one of the great objectives toward which the works program has directed its efforts. Boys and girls of today are the citizens of tomorrow, and it is our responsibility to assist them in becoming good citizens. Underprivileged children and those formerly cared for in various institutions have been removed from unhealthy environments and given a chance to spend at least part of the year in the wholesome atmosphere of camp life. fine camps, an abundance of good food is provided, and medical attention and general supervision are ensured by staffs of trained WPA employees. National monuments and regions of historic importance, such as Fort Niagara, attract thousands of visitors from all parts of the country, and the pleasure which these visitors derive is enhanced by the improvements and maintenance provided by the works program. Many frontier forts built during and before the revolution have been restored to their original condition to commemorate the valor of the nation's pioneers. Parts of several Midwest states provided the background for Abraham Lincoln's early life. The WPA has constructed or restored several historic shrines to Lincoln's boyhood. Here are cabins representing the store in which he worked, his early home, the law office from which he borrowed books, and other reminders of the presence of this great American.
In this picture, we have seen a few of the 120,000 projects that are embraced by the works program. Each of these projects has been planned to meet a real need in the community which it serves, to take care of the unemployed as well as to confer real and lasting benefits on the people of the United States is the object of the WPA. Under this program, work pays America.